Jagmak is from Bombay, India. He is a functional medical uh, practitioner and he has a keen interest in immuno-oncology and advanced immunology. Uh, he will discuss the cytokine value and its treatment in COVID-19. So we will not spend too much on this. Please watch the floor, Dr. Tariq. All right. So hi, everyone. Please turn your speakers to the maximum volume uh, because the sound quality is not very good from my end. Uh, if you can all hear me. So the basis of today's lecture or presentation is on our original research that we've done at our company. We have an internationally published paper and we have international patents on this work that we've done. Uh, what I'm going to explain is the various cytokine milieus in COVID and how we can use them in the treatment of COVID. And instead of using the boring presentations, I'm going to use a whiteboard to explain the pathways that we target. So let's start with my whiteboard. So let me draw the name of the topic and explain uh, at least the basis of it. So my pen has stopped working for some reason. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> just, uh, just hold on a second. I'll go back to the slides then. Okay. So the important part of what we are doing is we've converted injectable cytokines into oral low-dose forms. We all know that we can get cytokines as injectables. For example, interferon beta is an injectable cytokine. But what we've done is we've taken this cytokine and converted it into an oral form. Not just this one, but many others as well. So what really is a cytokine? A cytokine is a protein produced by immune cells and other cells. And its job is basically to communicate uh, the messages of one cell to the other in terms of stimulating an immune response. And what is an oral low-dose form? Is we've converted these injectable cytokines, as I said before, into an oral bioavailable form. Even though a cytokine is a protein and it should ideally be broken down in the gut and destroyed, we have been able to solve this problem and convert them into an oral form. Why is the oral form better in many ways than an injectable? So you see, for every cytokine that is produced, there is a wide biological threshold limit, which means it can fluctuate between a low end of normal and a high end of normal. If you give an injectable cytokine, the levels go beyond the biological threshold. And when that happens, you can create severe side effects. But in an oral low-dose form, you never cross the biological threshold. And hence, the medication has very high safety. What we are doing is we have taken a whole bunch of cytokines, which I'm going to explain, and converted them into this oral low-dose form and giving it to patients with COVID. And what we have seen is that there are certain similarities between COVID patients, but there are also differences. And what I'm going to talk to you is how we identify those differences and how we can tailor make treatments for such patients. So in this first slide, as you can see, is our published paper. Uh, which was done by us this year, and that is published in the Journal of Immunopharmacology and Immunotoxicology. Let's go to the next slide. So again, this slide is about what are cytokines. As I said, they are regulatory biomolecules which are produced in the body's immune system, and they act on the cells which are in their vicinity. The most common ones that you've heard of are interferons. So this is one of the examples of them. Let me switch to my pain command and see if that's working now. Oh yes, it is working. Great. So let me draw this out. What I'm going to draw is the immune pathway and how we target it. So let's assume that this is a virus. All right, let's give it some nice nasty horns. And this virus is just about to enter inside your epithelial cells of your nose. So assume these cells I'm drawing are the epithelial cells of your nose. The first cytokine that needs to be secreted in order to remove this virus is a cytokine called interferon lambda, which I'm going to draw here. 
This cytokine helps to take the viral RNA out and actually kill the virus when the viral load is low. So just when you've been exposed to somebody sneezing on you, it is interferon lambda which needs to form. But let's assume you have some other viral infection in your body, like say Epstein-Barr or CMV, which about 50% of us have. The interferon lambda levels do not rise, and because of which the virus starts to enter inside your epithelial cells. So what we are doing is we are giving low dose interferon lambda to our patients. So this is the first cytokine that we give. Once the virus enters inside your epithelial cell, it starts to multiply inside the epithelial cell and it hijacks the cell's ability to make other proteins. But still the cell, which is infected with the virus, sends out a cry for help. The cry for help is basically interferon beta. You may have heard of the cytokine in terms of the effects of vitamin C because vitamin C helps to stimulate the formation of interferon beta. What does this interferon beta do? It goes to the adjacent cell and stimulates mechanisms in the adjacent cell which are known as the antiviral state. In this stage, this uninfected cell starts creating enzymes such as PKR and it stays in a ready state. The moment the virus infects or tries to infect this cell, the cell mounts the immune attack using interferon beta and chops off the virus. But this COVID virus is very intelligent. As it infects the adjacent cell, because it takes over the cell's mechanisms for making proteins, it depletes the levels of interferon beta, which is why when you give vitamin C, we find that patients do improve in COVID. If interferon beta does not form adequately, then what your cell starts to do, it starts forming another interferon known as interferon alpha. But interferon alpha is not as good as interferon beta. The reason is when interferon alpha levels increase, you start developing clots in your body. So all we want to do at this stage is we want to pump up the levels of interferon beta. So the cytokine that we add is interferon beta. Now let's assume that your body's defense mechanism says, well, I give up, I don't have enough of interferon beta. Now this virus starts causing necrosis of the cell, it's causing necrosis of the cell and enters inside your tissue space. So this is your tissue space. Once it enters inside your tissue space, this nasty bugger has to be killed off by something. And who attacks our macrophages? So you have your tissue resident macrophages, which are present inside the tissue. They start to attack this virus and they try to affect it. They form a phagolysosome and they try to kill it off. But of course, the viral load at this time has increased and the tissue resident macrophages are not able to fight it out. So they send another cry for help. And the cry that they send is the levels of TNF alpha and IL-1 start to increase. Because it is TNF and IL-1 is the cry of help. And this is basically the inflammation that we see in COVID, the cry for help when the macrophage is not able to remove the virus out. This TNF and IL-1 act on the blood vessels which are present in the area. And of course, we are still talking about the nasal epithelium here. So let's assume that there's a blood vessel in the area. The TNF alpha and IL-1 act on the endothelial cells which are present in the blood vessel and cause them to contract. So when they contract, spaces start to form between the endothelial cells. So these are the receptors on the blood vessel on which TNF and IL-1 bind. As they bind, as I said, the cells contract and lots and lots of other neutrophils and monocytes start to flood the area. So now here you have a neutrophil and you have a monocyte which is turned into a macrophage. And these guys are now going chomp, chomp, chomp and trying to kill off the virus. This is not going to be enough. You also need your adaptive immune system and you need your NK cells to come. So the first part of your innate immune system is your NK cells. So now these natural killer cells need to come in and what they have to do is they have to target these necrotic cells. You see, in these necrotic cells, the virus is growing at a crazy rate. So the NK cell comes, let's assume it is here. It has flown through the bloodstream, escaped over here and now 
come on this receptor of the cell. The NK cell is supposed to come here, secrete its granzymes and porphyrins, and destroy the cell. Basically, if it destroys the cell, your viral load is decreased. This NK cell is stimulated by another cytokine, which is known as interleukin 15. And guess what? The COVID virus has RNA, which helps to knock off interleukin 15. If you have an Epstein Barr virus infection pre existing, your NK cell counts are basically close to zero. So you have no functioning NK cells. If interleukin 15 is given at that time, it's able to boost the NK cell activity and helps in the immune response. So another cytokine that we are adding to the milieu is interleukin 15. What else does TNF alpha and IL-1 do? TNF alpha and IL-1, as they enter inside your bloodstream, they have effects on your brain. So let's assume that there's a brain here. And in the brain, they stimulate the levels of prostaglandin E2, which leads to fever. Not only does prostaglandin E2 lead to fever, but it also starts to trigger antibody formation. TNF and IL-1 act on the liver. And in the liver, the liver starts making inflammatory substances, for example, ferritin. And it starts making interleukin-6. The job of ferritin is to basically absorb iron so that there's no free iron left to the virus to use as a source of multiplication. Because the virus uses iron as a source of nutrition to multiply. So when the liver increases ferritin, it holds the iron and doesn't allow the virus to get it. When the liver makes interleukin-6, interleukin-6 is a cytokine which is used in the antibody switch from IgM to IgG, thereby helping antibody formation. Which is why when the trial of tocilizumab was conducted, they found that it never led to any improvement in patient mortality or morbidity. Because if you block interleukin-6, you're basically blocking antibody formation. One other interesting aspect of prostaglandin E2 is this is the major protein which is blocked by aspirin. So even though aspirin does a lot of good, but when you give aspirin to a patient of COVID, it blocks prostaglandin E2. The good effect of it is it stops fever. The bad effect of it is it stops antibody formation. The last effect of interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha is on the bone. And in the bone, it stimulates the formation of more neutrophils, more lymphocytes, and more uh, macrophages. So your, your bone marrow gets stimulated to form more cells. All this is done in order to increase the inflammatory response. What we are doing is we are targeting ferritin and we are targeting incan 6. We are giving a molecule known as lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is a molecule which is present even in milk. And the job of lactoferrin is to act like a fake ferritin. It takes all that iron which is S and absorbs it in. It doesn't allow the virus to get hold of it. And because it does this, the liver doesn't think there's a process of inflammation going on. And it doesn't need to make that much of ferritin and that much of interleukin-6. You see, you require a little bit of interleukin-6. But if you go overboard and produce too much of it, it can cause a lot of damage. Because it also leads to further inflammation in the liver. So this, these are the basic cytokines. And we are at a stage where the adaptive immune system is still not being triggered. Just imagine now the virus has entered from the nasal epithelium all the way into the lung. In the lung, the same process is going on because the blood vessels have started to get inflamed. The cells have started to shrink over here and a lot of fluid has started entering inside the tissue space. So now the alveoli start getting filled with fluid. So what is the need for all this fluid? This fluid is basically plasma. It carries nutrition for all those PMNs and all those sites which have entered inside. Just about at the fourth day, so at day four, something starts to happen with your adaptive immune system. So in the tissue space, you also have these cells known as dendritic cells. These are known as DCs or dendritic cells. These dendritic cells capture some of the antigens of the virus and they enter inside your lymphatics. They go to your lymph node. So let's assume there's a lymph node over there. 
and they start triggering the formation of B cells. They first activate T cells, and then those T cells go and activate B cells. But that is the part of the adaptive immune system in which IgG starts forming. Before IgG, by the fourth day onwards, the, without presence of the dendritic cell also, the B cell starts to recognize viral antigens and starts forming IgMs. These IgM antibodies enter inside the tissue space via blood and they start activating your complement system. The complement system kills off some of the virus but again increases inflammation and that inflammation is basically a cry for help. It starts increasing the, the levels of histamine, it starts increasing the level of TNF and why is it doing this? It wants more and more macrophages to come in. This is why after the fourth day, the patient will start to decline if his viral load has not been reduced. After the fourth day onwards, all the way up till the seventh day, your innate immune system is trying very hard to fight the virus. And we are boosting it up with the levels of lambda, beta, interleukin-15 and lactoferrin. After the seventh day, you need to form your adaptive immune system antibodies. For that, your T cells inside your lymph node need to start getting activated. These T cells can be of three types, and I'm going to change the slide now to explain it. Second. Okay. So these T cells, or your CD4 T cells, Out of three types, you have your Th1, you have your Th2, and you have your Th17 cells. And you also have your CD8 T cells. The CD4 Th cells are basically helper cells in the sense that they don't directly kill, but they help in the killing process. And the one that you require for fighting viruses is your Th1 cell. The Th2 cells are usually used for killing parasites and the Th17 cells are basically used for killing things like fungal infections. But this virus and all viruses are very intelligent. Instead of allowing Th1 to get activated, they start activating Th2. And if Th2 gets activated by the virus, you are not going to be able to remove the viral infection. So the virus forces your immune system to start secreting interleukin-4 which is what activates the Th2 cells. So what we are doing is we are adding cytokines to stimulate Th1. And the cytokines we are adding are interleukin-12 and interferon gamma. So to the list that I had already mentioned, there is lambda, IL-15, there's beta, there's lactoferrin. And now there's also interferon gamma and interleukin-12. What are these two doing? So interleukin-12 is upping the levels of Th1. Interferon gamma is going and activating CD8 cells. It is also responsible for stimulating the killing of the virus in the macrophage. So just imagine that inside your lung, there is inflammation going on. The dendritic cell has taken the antigen of the virus, gone inside the neighboring lymph node. The lymph node has started making Th1 cells. Those Th1 cells go right back into the tissue space. And once they enter inside the tissue space, this is what they do. So assume this is a Th1 cell. It goes in for the macrophage, a nice fat macrophage, which has engulfed the virus. Assume this is a fat macrophage. And it's got all the viral load inside it. It binds to the macrophage, releases interferon gamma. When it's this, the macrophage increases the oxidative stress, which is present inside its uh, phagosome and kills the viral off. So why would the macrophage not do this without a Th1 cell? I mean, why isn't the macrophage not so smart? It should basically have just taken the virus and increase oxidative stress in order to remove the virus, isn't it? But it can't do that, you see, because if all the macrophages start making too much of oxidative stress inside them, you're going to cause a lot of damage to your body, which is again why vitamin C and things like glutathione play a major role in decreasing inflammation by decreasing the oxidative stress. So by adding interferon gamma and interleukin-12, 
and basically guiding the immune system to kill off the infection inside itself. Also, interferon gamma activates CD8 T cells. The CD8 T cells come into the area and start to kill off the virally infected cells by causing apoptosis of them. So your CD8 T cell, uh, let's go back and draw some of the stuff which I had drawn before. So let's draw the blood vessel again. So you have your blood vessel and you have your tissue space which is present over here. Okay. And let's say you have some epithelial cells present over here. And these are the alveoli. So I'm basically taking a picture of the alveoli present over there. And this is of course the blood vessel which is flowing near the alveoli. So I'm taking a section of this. So Present inside this area over here are all these infected cells. Okay. CD8 T cells emerge from your blood vessel. They enter inside this area and they start secreting just like your NK cell, porphyrins and granzymes. With these porphyrins and granzymes, small holes are poked in these cells and basically undergo apoptosis and complete cell death. Because of the cell death, the virus also dissipates and dies out. So you do need CD8 T cells in fighting an infection. So let's recap what my first line of treatment is. So we interferon lambda, we give interferon beta, we give IL-15, we give lactoferrin, we give uh, interleukin-12, and we give interferon gamma. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you want to recap it, it's very simple. The job of lambda in the beginning is when the viral load is low, your epithelial cells need to get rid of the virus before it enters inside them and replicate. If lambda is not there, not only do you not get Th1 stimulation, but also the virus will invade and infect. The role of beta is to prevent the adjacent epithelial cell from not dying and not allowing viruses to replicate in the adjacent epithelial cells. Or if interferon beta is not present in sufficient quantities, you are going to have increase in interferon alpha and that's going to start causing you clotting. The role of interleukin-15 is to activate your NK cells and start removing the viral load. The job of lactoferrin decreased ferritin to decrease interleukin-6 and the job of interleukin-12 and interferon gamma is to start increasing Th1 and CD8 activity. What we have found is with this basic combination of cytokines, we are able to treat almost 90% of the patients who have COVID. But there's something else that happens in COVID as well, which I want to explain. And here we come to what a cytokine storm actually is and how we manage it. So how do we come to know that there is a cytokine storm? We look at the CBC. In the CBC, we look at the N to L ratio, which is your neutrophil to your lymphocyte ratio. This ratio is very important because if the neutrophils are high and the lymphocytes are low, that means your virus has switched the ability of your body to attack it with lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are those CD4 Th1 lymphocytes and the CD8 lymphocytes. If those are low, you will not be able to fight off the virus with just your innate immune system consisting of neutrophils and macrophages. This ratio is very important. And what we know of is when this ratio cross crosses a magic number of 4.16, that is basically the start of a cytokine storm. For this, what we are currently using in, in normal allopathic practice is we are giving the patients corticosteroids. And while corticosteroids are very good is because, uh, is because they knock the receptors of TNF-alpha and IL-1 down. So even though TNF-alpha is being produced to a certain extent, it's not to act on the blood vessels. But the problem with the corticosteroid is that according to medical practice, a corticosteroid should only be used when this level of neutrophil to lymphocyte is more than 6.7. And when the patient is non-diabetic, and when the patient is hypoxic, and only then it should be used. 
So what you're basically saying is you have to wait for the cyclone to go really, really bad and only then give a steroid. Also, when you're using a steroid, what does a steroid do to the innate immune system? It increases it. So it's actually going to increase the manufacturing of white blood cells. It's going to increase neutrophils while decreasing the TNF and IL-1 uh, receptors which are present. So overall, it doesn't seem like a very good idea to use in the initial stage. So you do not want to use a cortic steroid when you're at this level. But there's still a cytokine storm happening, isn't it? What do we do about it? So here's what we found as a solution. And it's a pretty innovative idea. Just bear with me. We are using two products. The first one is VIP. VIP is, is basically a peptide called as vasoactive intestinal peptide. So let me write that down. Vasoactive intestinal peptide. This is a very fancy little molecule which your body makes when faced with a cytokine storm. And what it does is it switches off the manufacturing of TNF and IL-1 by your neutrophils and macrophages. So the cry for help that the neutrophil and macrophage was giving, calling its friends to help it, that cry is subdued. And that cry is basically what we are calling inflammation in COVID. So we are using VIP and we are using another molecule, which is called a trichostatin. Trichostatin is an HDAC inhibitor. So I'm going to explain what an HDAC is in short and how it is used in viral infections. It's an HDAC inhibitor. Or inhibitor. So HDACs are basically histone deacetylases and we are basically blocking them. So let's explain what an HDAC does in the next slide. So assume that this is a histone core. This is maybe a histone protein which I'm drawing. So that's a histone protein. As we know, our DNA is tightly wrapped around the histone protein. And when the DNA needs to be read, it needs to uncoil from the histone protein. For uncoiling, it adds an acetyl group to itself. So if you want to read DNA, you need to add an acetyl group. Add an acetyl group. So the acetyl group goes and binds to the histone protein. It makes the histone protein less positive, and then that less positive histone protein cannot bind to the negative DNA. And that's why the DNA starts getting red. So let me repeat, to read DNA and to transcribe proteins, you need to add an acetyl group to the histone protein. So your normal histone acid deacetylases, so you have your histone deacetylases, these are enzymes which basically remove that acetyl group and cause a tight coiling of the DNA onto the histone we have drawn. How is this applied to COVID? So you see, after the fourth day of you getting a viral infection, the histones in your uh, white blood cells, they start wrapping the DNA very tightly around them. They do this for two reasons. One is that they, do, they don't want to form too much of interferon. Now, I just said that interferon is good, right? So why do they not want to form it? Because if too much of interferon forms, you will have a lot of oxidative stress and you'll end up harming yourself. So in a rat experiment, if you remove the coiling of DNA and you allow the interferon to keep forming, what you have is the rat, every single rat which was infected with the influenza virus was able to remove the influenza virus if the DNA was being read. The moment the DNA was coiled up, the rat was not able to create interferon and the viral load increased. But the side effect of reading the DNA and making too much of interferon is every rat that cured itself of influenza ended up dying. So in short, what this basically means that in order to protect the body from dying, your body starts to wrap DNA for interferon very tightly around the histone core. So the body is saying, let's not make too much of interferon. It's a bad thing. But the problem here is, 
you need to make the right amount of interferon. If you make too much of it, you're in serious damage. And if you make too little of it, you're also causing yourself serious damage. So when we give low dose trichostatin, it removes this acetyl group. Let me draw it. It removes this enzyme out. It's an inhibitor of this enzyme. So the acetyl group cannot be removed anymore. And it is now bound to the histone protein. Because the acyl group remains on the histone protein, the histone protein basically turns green. And actually turn green, which is drawing a green. And it allows the DNA to start getting red. So some of this DNA gets red. And this DNA is a section that makes interferon. Because we are using low dose of it, we are able to make enough of interferon, keep your lymphocytes active. And as your lymphocytes keep staying active, the counts of your lymphocytes don't drop. So now what we have done is we have, we have improved the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. By adding VIP, we are decreasing neutrophil counts because we are blocking the receptors of TNF and IL-1. And we are also blocking the ability of the neutrophil to make TNF and IL-1. By giving the patient trichostatin in low dose form, we are able to increase the number of lymphocytes and hence we are correcting the ratio. Trichostatin also is a blocker of interleukin 1. And remember it is interleukin 1 that causes fever along with prostaglandin E2. So when we are giving this to cases, we are finding that the fever starts to dissipate very fast. They do not need any paracetamol or any other medication for their fever. What about the cough of the patient? Well, as you decrease the viral load, the complement pathway does not make any histamine. It stops making TNF, it stops making iron. So do the neutrophils and so do the macrophages. So there's less buildup of fluid inside the alveolar spaces and because of which the cough also dissipates. The liver at the same time is getting protected because of the lactoferrin, it is not inflaming as much. And because of the levels of interferon beta, which are going up, and the levels of interferon alpha, which are going down, the D-dimer of the patient also starts to improve and doesn't start shooting up. So this is the basic stuff that we are doing for COVID. We found some other very interesting things, which we are also targeting, which I'm just going to share with you just for the heck of it. So the first thing that we are finding is in patients who have autonomic neuropathy. So let's say you have a diabetic patient who's got, you know, tachycardia, or he's got peripheral neuropathy, or he's got some gastric issue because of which he gets constipated all the time. These are markers of autonomic neuropathy. And when they have this, they don't have the ability to form a proper sympathetic nervous system response. Neither do they have the ability to form a proper parasympathetic nervous res system response. So in the beginning of the infection, the SNS or your sympathetic nervous system is supposed to be pro-inflammatory. It basically increases the levels of TNF, increases the levels of IL-1 and allows neutrophils and macrophages to enter the area. This is actually a good thing because the Th1 cells ultimately stimulate the macrophages to remove the infection. And if those macrophages are not able to remove it, then the macrophages cry for more TNF, more IL-1 and then you have a cytokine storm and further inflammation. So in the beginning, SNS is good. But as the infection continues by approximately up to the seventh day or so, the SNS starts to withdraw from the area and starts creating an anti-inflammatory state. So if your patient has autonomic neuropathy and his sympathetic nervous system is down-regulated and the parasympathetic nervous system is also down-regulated, they are not able to mount a proper inflammatory response. So it's the first interesting thing that we have found in addition to the cytokine. The second interesting thing that we found is in the levels of vasopressin. You see, when you have an infection, vasopressin levels need to go up. The reason why they need to go up is actually twofold. First reason is because you have to hold on to water in your body since the water needs to go into the tissue spaces and help the macrophages in terms of giving them nutrition. So vasopressin is also known as your antidiuretic hormone. It stops you from passing so much of urine. It's antidiuretic. It holds the water in. Why is doing this? ADH has other functions. It helps to stimulate ACTH. It helps to stimulate cortisol. And during the resolution phase of the infection, if you don't have enough of vasopressin, 
you tend to have continuous inflammation. So what we found in patients who have a dry hacking cough, many of these patients have increased thirst. They feel very, very thirsty. And we have found that their vasopressin levels are very low. So when a little bit of vasopressin stimulator is given to them, their thirst becomes normal. They don't feel thirsty as, as much as they were feeling before. And their cough tends to decrease because of the vasopressin's effect on cortisol. The third neurohormone that we found is a little off in patients is the level of serotonin. So this is very, very interesting and I really find this fascinating, so I'm going to talk about it. So you have levels of dopamine and you have levels of serotonin. I think we all know this. Dopamine is a hormone that gives you the ability to complete tasks. It, it is a reward-giving hormone. So if you're playing a video game and you win in it, you want to play another game. And serotonin is a hormone which gives you tranquility. It makes you feel content with your life. Let's assume a patient has high levels of dopamine. Dopamine is a pretty nasty neurohormone when it comes to viral infections. Because if you're really a type A personality and you're facing a virus with a lot of dopamine in you, the dopamine is going to increase the activity of your neutrophils, going to make a lot of TNF, a lot of IL-1. And it also decreases the levels of your lymphocytes and makes your life real hell. It worsens the patient outcomes in COVID. What about serotonin? Serotonin does the reverse. It increases your lymphocyte counts. It decreases auto-reactive Th1 cells, which can cause harm to your body. And it decreases the levels of TNF-alpha. The levels of serotonin can be reduced when you are taking melatonin. If you have very high levels of melatonin, which you're consuming, it can actually cause inhibition for the formation of serotonin. Melatonin can sometimes form serotonin by stimulating in certain areas of the brain. But in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects of serotonin, it may actually block it. Melatonin is also pro-inflammatory. Many of our patients who are admitted into the hospital, the moment they get into the hospital, they start feeling worse. The reason why is because they are exposed to dark environments. The ICU is usually the light is kept low. Because of the dark environment, they start converting their serotonin into melatonin. Because of the levels of stress in their body, the levels of serotonin start to go low and the levels of dopamine start to go high. So when serotonin is low, and you are not exposed to enough of sunlight, you start having issues with fighting the viral infection and you start creating cytokine storms. So we found when we give such patients a little bit of serotonin, they do really well. Serotonin, the clear marker for low serotonin is constipation. Serotonin helps to increase the levels of the uh, cells of Kajal in your intestine and helps to track them. So when serotonin is low, the patient simply cannot poop. He requires to take a Dalcolax or he requires to take some other medication to help him poo. So all we need to ask the patient is, can you poo? And if he says no, we know that we need to give him some serotonin. For vasopressin, all we need to do is to ask the patient, are you thirstless? Are you thirsty? Very, very thirsty. Most of the times the patient says, I feel very thirsty and I drink a whole bunch of water. For the sympathetic nervous system, it's also very simple to ask. If they are diabetic and they have problems with autonomic neuropathy, it is pretty much assumed that they have a faulty sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. So this is how we are managing COVID patients. And uh, let me give you some experience about what we have done with it. So we first started by just using interferon lambda. And we found that when we were giving just lambda to patients, they were getting protected COVID. So the viral load in their bodies was decreasing when they were being exposed to COVID. When we added interferon beta, we found the fever started to dissipate in patients who are having uh, COVID with high viral loads. Because if you just use interferon lambda and your viral load is high, lambda has no effect. So then it was a beta which started to show effects. Then I, I ended up thinking, well, let, let me add IL-15 because we've started finding patients with severe COVID also had pre-existing Epstein-Barr and CNP. When we started adding IL-15, we found really good responses. Then we added the IL-12, then we added interferon gamma, then we added lactoferrin. 
And now finally, we've added VIP and tricostatin as a second line of treatment in patients with cytokine storms. Uh, the first patient we tried this on was a patient in the ICU in a state of Gujarat in India. He was on a ventilator and the chance that he was going to survive was zero. The doctors had given up on him. So the patient's family took uh, a written permission from the hospital. They were going to give an, experiment, uh, an experimental treatment to the patient. After giving the treatment to the patient, the patient recovered within just two days. He was off his ventilator and he was breathing normally within just two days. His D-dimers came to normal within those two days. So it was a fantastic case. The patient recovered completely. And uh, because he recovered, he actually started a hospital in the state of Gujarat, which was free. And it still runs completely free of cost. Treats hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients there free of cost. His name has also come, uh, I mean, he has been featured on BBC as well as uh, where he talks about his experience from recovering from COVID. After that, uh, we have given it to the employees of our, of our company. We have uh, employee strength of over a thousand. So uh, our employees, the families, all of them have been taking our meds. So that's a patient bank of at least three to four thousand people. Beyond that, so many, so many patients that we have done all over the country using our medication. So I hope you all have found this uh, little presentation interesting. I'm going to go just run through the slides just to show you everything. So trying to shift the slide. All right, so we were at low dose cytokines where I left out. This slide basically just talks about how the low dose cytokines are better than the injectable in many ways. First of all, they're oral. You can take it in the luxury of your house. You don't have to go any for it. And also they're very safe because they don't allow the levels to cross biological threshold. Next. These are already uh, pre-existing published papers on low-dose cytokines. This is a paper, it was done on mice, which have shown increase in peripheral white blood cell counts without the presence of uh, it interferons in the blood. So even though you're giving the low-dose cytokines, the levels in the cells are increasing, but there's no actual increase in the blood. This is what we also found. We've also used uh, IL-10, anti-IL-1 in patients with colitis, and we found it has worked very well there as well. So this is a bunch of published papers on interleukin-12 and interferon gamma when used in a low-dose form. This is a published paper on the use of interferon gamma and the stimulation of NK cells, where interferon gamma not only stimulates NK cells, but also stimulates the CD8 T cells. Uh, this is just a, a slide which shows how the oral administration of cytokines have beneficial systemic effects as well. Uh, this is an experimental treatment of uh, Jogren's with the use of interferon alpha. Now we come to the fun part with the antiviral immune response to COVID-19 using my meds. This slide talks about interferon lambda, where it targets the virus in the early stage, right when the load is low. And after that, if it uh, does not function very well, the virus enters inside your upper airways and your lungs. So interferon lambda is the first responder interferon gamma, the last point, before any other interferon is made. Thus, if interferon lambda fails, then the virus enters the lung and causes inflammation. Interferon lambda as an antiviral agent. These are the published papers of it. We are the first people who have made it into this low dose form and we have used it for COVID-19. This is a paper on the use of interferon lambda in influenza viruses. This is a paper on the types of interferon, uh, alpha and beta, where interferon beta actually protects the adjacent cells by increasing proteinase R. It also explains how vitamin C increases the release of interferon beta and hence is antiviral. This is interferon beta as an antiviral agent. These are the published papers on it. This is the role of NK cells in IL-15. So interleukin-15 has effects beyond NK cells, where interleukin-15, when given to patients who have taken the vaccine, actually boosts the effect of the vaccine because it allows antibody formation to continue. IL-15 is not just something that you can use when you have COVID. It also helps you to boost the effect of the vaccine. 
And what we have found is in patients who have taken this uh, combination, even as a prophylactic, their fatigue levels have improved. When we have checked the total uh, GG of these patients to Epstein-Barr and CMV, we found them to be very high. So these patients already had chronic fatigue. They took our med and the fatigue decreased. In many of the patients, the chronic fatigue or the fibromyalgia pains actually completely disappeared after taking the med. So IL-15, not only great for forming antibodies, improving vaccine responses, but also very good at activating your NK cells and very good in fighting of all viral infections and, of course, even in cancers. These are published papers of IL-15 as an antiviral agent. So I'm just going to keep it on for some time. Where it increases the CD8 T cell population, it increases NK cells, increases interferon gamma function. This is the role, uh, role of interferon gamma and IL-12 in viral infections. Here we're talking about how it activates TH1, decreases TH2. Also, the interferon gamma triggers the checkpoint PD-1, which I did not explain before. So if your PD-1 starts getting expressed, you're going to have decreased tissue inflammation. This is also an issue in cancer, because if too much of interferon gamma is given in a cancer patient, it expresses PD-1 and can actually make the cancer worse. So when you're PD-1 for cancer patients, you have to use it with a PD-1 inhibitor. This is the role of IL-12 in viral infections, where it activates TH1. There are some preclinical studies on IL-12. This is on the role of lactoferrin, where it decreases the levels of CRP, ferritin, improves the SpO2, decreases cough, decreases IL-6. This is lactoferrin as an antiviral for other viral infections. This is a preclinical study of lactoferrin. And this is about the cytokine storm where VIP helps to decrease the production of interleukin-2. It decreases the uh, 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 manufacturing of TNF and IL-1 as well. Uh, antioxidants like glutathione are very effective to quieten the cytokine storm because of their antioxidant effects. You can even use vitamin C over here. But remember, ultimately, vitamin C needs to give the molecule or the oxidative stress molecule back to glutathione, which then removes it. So if you're not using glutathione and you're just using vitamin C, ultimately, the uh, chain which transmits the oxidative stress and removes it will not be there if glutathione is low. So in conclusion, I can just say that this uh, cytokine milieu that we've been using is uh, very effective in our COVID patients. We also give glutathione in patients with severe fatigue. So if the patient says, I'm having a lot of muscle pain, I'm having a lot of back pain, that's a, that's a symptom that they are having a lot of oxidative stress, where we give our patented glutathione formulation. So we have a patent on this. And it's one of the only oral tablets of glutathione out there on the market, which has a published paper on it as well. And we've actually done trials of it to show that it increases systemic glutathione levels. Additionally, if the patient still has high fever, we, we can even use anti-interleukin-1 to block the IL-1. And in many patients, we have also used anti-IL-6, especially if they have a lot of viral hepatitis in them. So this is just some safety studies that we've done of our product. These are the results of the safety studies which we did. We are published. So thank you, everybody, for attending this. This is my website, tarekjagmuk.com. And I would uh, recommend that if you have taken melatonin on an SSRI and a benzodiazepine and you're still not getting sleep to visit my website, I'm sure you will be put to sleep after seeing my website. So thank you, everybody, <laughs> for watching this. <laughs> and I'm willing to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Jay.